hotspot in, um, cross per click marketing, search engine optimization, and it's a really important kind of thing. However, I do think that one of the things I'm, I'm seeking to do is convert everybody here into permission marketing zealots and, and really figure out um, how we can convert prospects into paying customers. Um, so, quick question, how many people here have purchased drill bits? Okay, Tom, why'd you buy drill bits? Because you needed them. Okay. <laughs> Who else has bought drill bits? Ben, why'd you buy drill bits? I broke the other ones. Yeah. You broke the other ones. Okay, Tim, why'd you buy a drill bit? The drill didn't come with the size I needed. Okay. <laughs> okay. Who else has bought drill bits? I know Jesse has. Okay, Deb. Same reason as Tim. Okay. The reality is nobody wants to buy drill bits. You don't need drill bits. I mean, you might think you need drill bits, and this is what this advertisement says it's a 301 piece drill bit as seen on TV, masonry, titanium coated, great drill bit set. But people don't need drill bits. And one of the problems in business and with what we do and with what our customers do is we're selling drill bits. We have the best drill bits in the world, but the reality is nobody wants drill bits. People want holes. <laughs> and so you can sell a commodity like this or you can provide the solution, which is really what they need is a hole in the wall to hang something, to pass wires through, or something like that. So instead of focusing on, hey, we have the best drill bits in the world, focus instead on, we have the solution to your problem, which might be drill bits, but might be a hole, or it might be a way to go around that and not have to drill holes in your house. Um, so one of the things that um, is increasingly um, happening is customers are a lot more in control. And we, as a business, are not. People have lots of choices when they want to work with a Magento developer, um, a uh, search engine optimization team, email marketing. There's, you know, you do a Google search, and if they don't like us, then we'll go to the next person. That didn't used to be the case before the internet, before all this stuff. You had a small town, and you need some electrical work done. Well, there's two electricians, and you're going to talk to one or the other. And that's about the choice that you have. Um, so in the business school world, this is the typical five force analysis uh, that, you, that they put up there. And they say, you as the business in the middle, and you have buyers, um, so they have different uh, choices. Competitors uh, like Orange Collar in Denver, and Unleaded Group, and Gorilla Group in Chicago, and all the other uh, uh, people in their basement doing web development and <laughs> thinking that they can do Magento really well, but you know not doing it so well. And then those companies call us because they say, hey, we can't figure this out. Uh, suppliers, like Magento, who would supply software. Substitutes, what else would work? OS Commerce, WordPress, uh, e-commerce plugins. Um, and then new entrants into the market. So this is typically how you would view the competitive landscape shaping who we are and where we are in, in the business world. In the past 20 years, a lot of things have changed. So it used to be that that's what it was. Now you have globalization, deregulation, and digitalization. So globalization, now we're competing not necessarily just with people here, but we're competing against Indian programmers, Kiev programmers, and all the rest. Now we're better than them, um, and I don't mind saying this and saying this on YouTube and all the rest. Um, what we have found is that we've tried that, and it, it stinks because the quality is low um, for the most part. Um, and the, um, the geographic distance is really difficult um, because the time lag and we were spending probably five to six times as much project management. We had a lot of frustrated clients. Um, so we brought everybody in, but we're still competing with other companies who can sell cheaper based on globalization because we're not competing just in the Boulder Denver market. Um, deregulation, a lot of um, formerly protected industries like Airlines, package delivery, telephone systems, all the rest, used to be tightly controlled by the government and they set the prices for long distance phone calls or airlines or anything like that. And that has changed uh, to drive the prices way down. Um, and then finally, digitalization. I think everybody here gets this, but the difference between where Ben grew up outside of Detroit, um, where they make cars, is when you want to make another car, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of um, time and energy and raw materials like steel and um, tires and glass and aluminum and, and all the rest to make that extra one. With our appointment scheduling system, it's digital. So there's a lot that went into it, but now we can replicate that fairly easily. Um, and so those are some of the, the competitive forces that have changed over the world. Um, this is going to be a little bit um, for probably Tom uh, will. Do you remember the uh, TVs with the dial on them and you know no remote control? Anybody else remember that? 
Okay, there's some people here. Okay, so I'm not that old. Um, so it used to be in the in the olden days um, when you woke up on a Saturday morning, you had a dial, you had you know ten channels, and then those strange UHF channels that were rarely on, and rabbit ears and stuff like that. Um, and what what happened was there was information was pushed out to users. The broadcasters, the people in charge of ABC, CBS. NBC, they were who decided what you watched, when you watched it, and that was it. You didn't have much choice. Um, the cool thing was everybody could walk in the next day and say, hey, did you see this on TV? Because really you had three choices. Um, and it was probably the Johnny Carson show way back when, or whatever. Um, so kind of the, the middle is VCR and cable. Um, so now I have you know 985 channels, still nothing to watch. Um, but uh, at any given time. Um, and what it allows you to do with on-demand, with VHS, which started it, but was difficult to do now with DVRs, is time shifting. So, okay, they decided what you watched, but n now you can record it and then play it back later. And then finally, with the internet, billions and billions and billions of web pages, and end users can pull down information whenever, wherever they want, at any time of the day, and it aggregates people according to interest instead of geography. So for example, discount decorating, it's tough to sell a lot of wallpaper in Boulder, Colorado. But in the past 24 hours, they've had sales to Qatar, to um, Russia, to France, to Germany, and, and all the rest. They're aggregating interest regardless of geography. And that's one of the amazing things about the internet. So in the past 25 years, the end user has taken control over the information coming to them. You're no longer passive. You're going out there and, and getting things. So, when we talk about our messaging, broadcasting and email or blasting it out to the list, that's implying that we still have that same level of control that the advertisers have. And we're guilty of this um, all the time. Hey, let's blast this out to this list or whatever. Um, if we're talking about co-registrations or signed up at sweepstakes, that's a whole different um, ideological message than having a conversation with past customers and prospects. Retention marketing versus acquisition. So. Um, this is one of my favorite slides of all time, the dancing banana slide, so I'll do it again. Um, so how many times have you seen an ad on TV or a billboard that is basically dancing bananas? And they're waving their arms around, waving their arms around, trying to grab your attention and say, Ben, pay attention, Ben, pay attention, Ben, pay attention, Ben, pay attention. And so they spend 95% of their time trying to distract you and grab your attention because we have really good filters on. As we go down the street, as we walk through the grocery store, we know exactly what we want to get. Um, if we didn't have those filters, we'd be autistic and, you know, you're just overwhelmed by everything. Um, that's not you. Yeah, could be. Um, so one of the problems is that you, because there's so much marketing stuff out there, um, I mean, how many people have recently clicked on any kind of ad in Facebook? That would be nobody. Um, because we're really good at just, you know, we don't really care about this new gout study that's coming out or whatever. Um, what we really care about is somebody's birthday and really he said that. Um, so a lot of good marketing can start with distraction marketing, but one of the problems with distraction marketing is that you spend so much time distracting people that then you don't really have any time to figure out and, and say what you guys, what your product or service is. Um, one of, the, one of the biggest problems with uh, the Aflac duck, anybody remember that? Um, one of the problems was everybody knew who the Aflac duck was and it did everything, but nobody really knew that it was supplemental insurance. Um, so they actually changed that a couple of years ago uh, to do that. Um, what I believe really, truly, is attention is an asset. It's probably the greatest asset that any company or organization has. Attention, so when we call somebody on the phone, they pick up. When we email people, they pay attention. Um, attention is an asset and it's hard to win, uh, but once you have it, then you don't have to constantly engage people um, again and again and again with distracted people. So permission marketing is uh, a theory that basically says turn strangers into friends and friends into paying customers. And you start with a low involvement, low commitment type of activity and recognize that it's a process. Um, so. How many people here are married? Okay, so for the people who aren't, um, there's a couple ways to get married. And I'll just boil this down to two ways. Um, and Tim's, are, you know, Tim's getting married at the end of the month, so you don't, you don't have to pay attention. Okay, 
Okay, so method A. <laughs> so method A is walk up to somebody on the street, some stranger, and say, hey, will you marry me? And I guess of all the people here, I'd probably see Ben doing that. Um, <laughs> not to pick on Ben too much, but... In all fairness, Ben, she's wearing a Wookiee costume. <laughs> yeah, so that could work. So that's a pretty big commitment. That's kind of like us calling up somebody in the Wookiee costume. You know, I could see that work. Will you marry me on <laughs> right. so, um, so that's a pretty big commitment. That's like us calling up somebody and saying, hey, will you buy a really expensive $30,000 uh, product right now? You know, that's kind of how, you know, it, it's a big question until death do us part. Um, so there's, in a lot of business interactions and in a lot of marketing, we're always asking for the, hey, will you marry me? As opposed to Ben seeing somebody um, and uh, saying, hey, will you meet me tomorrow afternoon at 2.30 in a well-lit public location for coffee? <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work either, so... Yeah. That's that doesn't work either? either. <laughs> All right. So, you know, just show our hands, what do you think is going to be more successful long-term? Coffee or just popping the big question? Coffee. Yeah, Ben's going to go with the big question. Um, so... Likewise, it's uh, <laughs> Serena liked that. Is that how so you good. and Alec got involved? Yeah, public place. Sure. No. Oh, okay, <laughs> sounds good. All right. So 